Good morning, church. We are so glad that you are here this morning. I'd like to start out by saying happy Mother's Day to all you mothers that are here this morning. This is uh, a year ago on Mother's Day. We weren't here. Isn't that amazing? One of the first Mother's Days that I think I've ever remembered that we actually physically weren't in church. So we've come a long way since then. We're so glad that you are here this morning. Would you please, as we begin our worship this morning, would you stand with us and we'll open with a time of prayer. Almighty Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have to come and sing praises to you, hear a message from your word, and meet around your table this morning, Father. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have here. And Father, I just pray a special blessing upon this service, and we pray it be a blessing unto us and unto your kingdom as well. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Give thanks to our God, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good and is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty name and outstretched arm. His love Thank you. 
How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to Hela and spoke. Oh, 
would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for that glorious day that your son walked out of that grave. And Father, we thank you for the life that we can have through you for the sacrifice that he made. Father, again, we thank you for that sacrifice and we thank you for this time we have this evening, this morning to meet around your table and hear a message from your word. All these things I ask and pray in your son's name. Amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss for kids all worship. So, in case you go back and see Miss Connie. Good morning. And again, happy Mother's Day. And the... Um, Days do go quickly, Kevin, but this is morning, not evening. It's been a long day already, huh? What a deal. I hope you are having a good Mother's Day, whether you, uh, however that works in your life, because everybody's not the same and everybody's families aren't the same, but I see a lot of kids out there with their mothers, and that's a great thing. Um, I got to share with my mother a little bit last night. It was pretty fun. It wasn't very long, but it was good. And so we'll get, we, the, the days go on. As many of our mothers are gone, I pray that we look for that great reunion when we get to see them, if indeed they died in Christ. And we are faithful to the end, and we too will be there. I want to share with you a different Mother's Day sermon today that I have not shared with you before. So if you were turning to Galatians chapter 4, you're out of business. And I, I just had this uh, placed on my heart to do this sermon because it has to do with who we are. And I love this series that we've been sharing about. started out with who am I and now who are we as the church and I want to share with you today a story. A mother at first has no name. We don't know who or what her name is and how she was involved because we are people of providence. And that is what we're going to share about today. And what does that mean? Providence is divine guidance in your life. When things happen and there's no explanation, when things happen because, wow, we step back minutes or months or years later and say, look how that happened. And we give the glory to God and, and, and know that we are people of providence. The church is providence guided by divine influence. First and foremost, through the Holy Spirit. Secondly, through the power of the Word. And thirdly, as a unit that works together for the benefit of the kingdom. The church is unstoppable, Jesus says, and nothing will prevail against it. And I believe that with all my heart, no matter what's going on and whatever the situation is politically or socially in our lives, the church is here, it's strong, and it's ready to serve and to do what the church is called to do. Reach out to the one that's lost, look after the 99. And that's what the church is. And if we follow that example, we will not be disappointed. We're going to be disappointed with people. How many had someone in your life this week that just disappointed you? I did. Because I thought they would do better than they did, and they didn't. And shame on us when we ever get to the point and say, well, I don't have any faith in them anyway. Now, there's people in life I don't have any faith in. And you know some of them because we voted for them. I don't have any faith in those people at all. I have faith in the garbage man. This guy's great. I love him. Told him, thank you. Because he does things I wouldn't do for me. Unbelievable. I have faith in the man no matter what the weather is, pouring down rain Thursday, literally in the middle of a thunderstorm, gets out and gets my garbage and gets back in his truck soaking wet. Who does that for people? I want to share with you this day a story of who does this. It's a mother that we don't know her name, but 
we do for later find out her name. It's a very odd name. Some of you have weird names. I have a very generic name. I was named after an actor. My mom watched a movie. That's what I'm going to call the kid. Greg, Gregory Peck. I hear about it regularly. My mom tells me about it every time she sees him. Oh, I named you after him. Okay, mom, thanks. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 1. Now you know who it is. The mother of Moses. And what this lady did because she had providence in her life. Divine influence. You know what? You and I have the exact same providence. Exactly the same. The motives are the, exactly the same as this lady. Exodus chapter 1. The Israelites have been how many years down there in Egypt? Anybody? 400. We love history and we love numbers and they are important and thank you for knowing that. If you did not know that, do not feel bad. I don't know your name. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We sometimes remember things, sometimes we don't, but it's good to remind ourselves. They've been there 400 years. Finally, uh, the Egyptian king is born and raised who doesn't know, he doesn't know anything about Joseph. Verse 8, Exodus chapter 1. We're going to read a little bit because it's important to read this. Uh, down to 210. It's a long passage, but it won't take long. A couple of columns. This is Exodus 1, starting at verse 8, down to chapter 2, verse 10. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply in the event of war they also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built Pharaoh's storage cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out. So they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. And their laborers, which were rigorously, were rigorously imposed upon them. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sapphira, and the other was named Pura. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, you shall, she shall live. And the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. Amen. What a verse. The king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. And they give birth before we can get there. <laughs> what? What a story. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. And it came about because the midwives feared God that He established households for them. And Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. What a story, because... That instinct that life is always good. Life is precious. Life is a gift of providence. Many of us in our lives have had lives taken from us that we don't understand. 
and we know how life is so precious to God, and we just wonder how bad things can happen. I was talking to one of our guys yesterday about how hard it is to go to a children's hospital. If you've been to one, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard enough to go to a hospital with adults, let alone children. And the world does not respect life the way that a man or woman of God respects life. Amen? This king, this Pharaoh, had no respect of life, especially of slaves. He didn't care one iota. He didn't care about the families. He didn't care about the mothers or the fathers or the children that he wanted drowned in the river. But these women had a respect for life. One of the characteristics of a godly man or woman is respecting life. Then this story, chapter 2, 1 through 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she led him, she hid him for three months. Now this, she already has one son that's three years older. That's Moses' brother. He's older than he is. And I didn't look up to see how about his sister, but obviously his sister is older, older as well because she's able to watch as this unfolds and to do something about it. When she could hide him no longer, verse 3, she got him in a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch and put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. I guarantee you they put it close to this palace on purpose. It wasn't an accidental put it in the reeds just anywhere. Make sure you get it right over there. The Pharaoh, then the daughter of Pharaoh, came down to bathe in the Nile with her maidens. Walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. I'm telling you that nothing melts a woman's heart quicker than any little kid crying. I don't care what they made. It just They could have just took a ball bat and killed your cat. But if they're balling, you're going to pick them up and say, oh, it's okay. But if I did that... I'm going to prison. So you guys know the drill. All you got to do is start bawling and crying and everything will be good. Little old Moses is crying and she can't take it. Then the sister, well, well, verse 6, Then she opened it, saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying, and she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. I don't know what distinguished them. They all look the same to me, but what do I know? Obviously, it was distinguishable. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from among the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. And the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. The unnamed mother who loved life so much and knew there was probably going to be some dire consequences if this child was found. Now, maybe not only for her, but maybe for her other children, the son that was three years older and this daughter, probably Miram. I don't know, there could have been other kids. And eventually she had to do what she did because of that fear. But she wasn't just going to throw him in the river because life is too precious and devise this plan. This plan was providence. The divine influence from God with His hand working every minute in every aspect. And we know this story. We, if you've been in church, you've been taught this story. 
And it's a great one. It's true. As the young man grew, we know, I'm going to just skip forward here a little bit. We find out the mother's name and the father's name and the kids. Moses gets to be about 40 years old. He, re- he knows he's a, not an Egyptian. He knows he's a Hebrew. And who knows what all that is and meant to him. The Bible says he looked this way and that way. And when no one was looking, he took the mean Egyptian that was beating one of his buddies and killed him. Then he's in scared and he runs. And he runs to his father-in-law Jethro. And he runs out to the desert and Jethro's daughters are watering their flock. And some other shepherds come and they're telling the daughters to get lost. It's their water, whatever the argument was. And Moses saves the daughters from the shepherds and ends up meeting his father-in-law and he gives her Zipper, Is that her name? Oh, Zephira? No, that ain't it either. Zipporah. Very good. I knew it started with a Z. Now it's Zipporah. He lives there 40 years. He's got some boys. And then God comes back into his life because Providence had never left. Even though he left home, he left everything he knew. He was out in the world, you could say. Forty years later, he returns because the hand of God is still on him. You know, the hand of God will never, ever leave us as long as we're breathing and if we will look out and just grab his hand. He'll always be there. It don't matter how many years or what's been done or where you've been or haven't been. As Kevin said, it's been a year plus since we were in church together. We came back to church July the 5th. You remember that? Yeah, sure you do. We still haven't got to see everyone back in church yet. We sure like to. We want folks back in the house. It's important to have that fellowship and that belonging, the sharing together. God shows up. Moses is 80. And we're going to pick up the story there, just a few verses out of chapter 3 of God introducing Himself to Moses, and then we're going to switch over to chapter 6. This is one of the places in our Bibles that I like to refer to regularly. I love these verses because they come to you and me today. The Lord said, I have surely seen... This is Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. We're going to read oh, down through 14 or so. The Lord said, Exodus 3, 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down here to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, Pezrite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel have come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression in which the Egyptians are oppressing them, Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people and my sons of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses asked this great question, Who am I? All of the scripture about the church, starting with this very spot, Who am I? I, you, we, are the people on whom God's hand rests. And nothing is impossible for us. 
nothing. Because we are people of providence. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, that's he with a capitalization, God Almighty, Jesus, Yahweh. And from this point forward, capital L-O-R-D in your Bibles. And we'll read that in a minute. Certainly I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Now, if you back up and read the story, he guess where he is? Yes, he's at Mount Horeb or at Mount Sinai. Same name. Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And Now they may say to me, What is his name? And what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, <laughs> Don't you just love this? I can't really say it. I am who I am. Mary, did you know the little baby in your arms is the great I am? Who was that? It's Jesus. Who did Jesus say that he was when he was in so many times in trial? They say that you're the king of the Jews. And Jesus says, I am. It starts right here. When Moses says, who are you? I am. He is. And we are his children. Children of providence. Chapter 6. First eight verses. I'm going to read this two times, okay? The first time I'm going to read it the way that it's supposed to be read, and the second time I'm going to read it the way if we found it in the New Testament. You get it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for under compulsion he shall let you go, and under compulsion he shall drive you out of, the, out of his land. And God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, L-O-R-D, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them and gave them the land of Canaan in which they sojourned. And furthermore, I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will make... For you, my people, I will take for you, my people, and I will bring God, I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you from out, from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Now, I want to share with you how this relates to me and you because of who we are. And I'm going to change the words. And it's not going to be in your scripture. So just take it off the screen, if you would, Mike, and I want you to listen how it reflects directly to us today, this morning, this time. We are them. Listen. God spoke further to the people and said to them, I am the Lord. 
I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them eternal, eternal land in which they will sojourn. And furthermore, I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel because sin is holding them in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burden of sin. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you for my people and I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord God who brought you out from under the burden of sin. And I will bring you to a land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession, as I am the Lord. Just by taking the word Egyptian and putting the word sin in its place, it automatically takes it straight to today, to us, the church, to our message, to our essence, to who we are. I am a child of providence, a child who is looking forward to the possession of land that is eternal and perfect, and God will be there, and we will be there. There will be no barrier the barrier has been sin. It will continue to be sin until we take that sweet, great confession of faith and give it to our Lord and say, I believe that you came, you died, you rose on the third day, and that you will take my sin. And in, an, in exchange for that, I will be your son and I will be your daughter to live in that great place. Revelation 21. Please turn there. You guys know these, but it is so encouraging to us because this is the promise. This is our land. And it's how we get there. And this is Jesus speaking. Capital L-R-D, Yahweh. 21 verse 2. I'm just going to read down through verse 7, and then we're going to read the end of the chapter. I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned, her, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. We just read those verses from the very first man who wrote in the Old Testament as a prophet of God, which was Moses. And we're ending our Bibles through an apostle of God, John, who wrote these words that Jesus shared with him to write. Verse 4. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things are gone. Aren't you glad and can't wait? I know every single family in this room can't wait till those things are gone. They're never going to be gone here. But the promise of providence is that all who take on the name of Christ, who start in that watery grave, who die to this world and come out of there a brand new creature in Christ as God intended it to be, and from then on strive to serve our living Savior. This is our hope. This is where we're going. This is where we're headed, to no pain, no crying, no death, no disease, and no separation. 
All those things have passed away. Verse 5, He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Right, for these things are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. What do we got to overcome, folks? Pride, number one. I'm not getting there by myself. Number two, I have got to be obedient to this word. I've got to overcome my thoughts in my head that says I'm smarter than God. No, I'm not. There is no way without Jesus that we're going to see Him. There is no way without being obedient to the Word, teaching us how to be faithful that we're going to see Him. This morning before church started, Rick and I was talking in the back. You know, he hides behind that screen and I can't see him because he's only this tall. I see you. Every funeral you go to, everybody's going to heaven. No, they're not. No, they're not. What a false pretense Satan has put upon us. Verse 22, chapter 21, Revelation. I didn't see a temple in the city, John writes. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of a sun or a moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, in parentheses, my Bible says, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed." And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination or lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. I don't need to even ask you because you already know the question, don't you? Is my name written there? Am I in? If you don't know the answer to that question this morning, or if you're watching online, whenever you see this, I want you to be confident that your name is written in the book of life. You need to be. Because God has no intention of you thinking throughout your life, I just don't know if I'm going to get to go with Jesus. He wants you to be sure about it. His promises are simple. And one thing we read over very quickly, He remembered His covenant. He makes a covenant, an agreement with all of us. It's about this blood. Lenny's going to come share with us in just a minute about this blood. We keep ourselves clean. And we get dressed in those wedding clothes for the bride of Christ, we're in. That's as simple as that. That means I've started with the baptism after I've understood who Jesus is. I meet around the Lord's table whenever I can because this is very important. Jesus shared with us how important this is. We do it every week out of tradition. It's a good one. And the third thing is, is, listen, church, listen, folks online, is meeting together in the house of God. It is important. John, 1 John 7, 1. I'm not going to go over there. You read it. It's important to be together. We do those things. And our name's going to be there. And you should have no question about whether or not the sin in my life is forgiven. 
whether or not God's going to accept me. All those things aren't an excuse to sin. All those things are is a way to keep sin removed from my life. Because remember, I gave my life to Christ. And Christ says, if you can overcome life and overcome sin, you're in. So we're striving every day. Is your name written in the book of life? After Lenny comes, we're going to have a closing hymn. I'm going to be up here. Kevin's going to be up here. If you need to speak with one of our elders or teachers, come, let's visit. After church. Lenny. Brush your teeth. Comb your hair. Put on clean underwear in case you're in an accident. Those words echo in my mind. Mothers, grandmothers, had the most important, the most difficult, and the most rewarding job since the creation of mankind. Thank you. Mothers have did have done uh, everything for us uh, from the time we were born. They housed us, they fed us, they kept us clean, but most of all they gave us advice. And uh, very good advice. Would we listen? Uh, some of it we listened to. You remember when you were a teenager and you got that advice, you said, oh, mom. You know, then you followed it or you didn't. But mothers usually gave good advice. Now, there's one thing mothers couldn't do. They couldn't take away sin. They would if they could, but they couldn't. They could warn us against the things that would cause us to fall, but we might listen, we might not. So, Jesus had more love for us than anyone you can imagine. Mother's love for us was second only to Jesus. Jesus thought of his mother even when he was preparing to take away our sin. John 19, verse 25. <clears throat> Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of uh, Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. So he was concerned about his mother even as he was facing the physical death. But Jesus came back to life. And that's what we celebrate here today is this death, burial, resurrection. The blood He shed to cover our sins, to make us whole, to make us pure. That we have those promises that Greg spoke about. So as we meet around this table, uh, remember your mothers, but remember the one that trumped that, Jesus Christ. The two probably most important people in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, the day that we can celebrate uh, our, our mothers and recognize them for the things that they've done for us through life, Father. It's, most of all, Father, we remember Jesus and what he 
what he did for us, the suffering, the pain, and he endured on that cross until the end. But Father, that wasn't the end. And we just give you the glory for that. Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed to cover our sins. We thank you for the guidance that we get from your word. We ask a blessing upon these emblems and upon each one here as we partake together. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us as we close with the stand this morning. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion. My soul now to stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now to stand. So what can I say? And what could I do? Oh, oh, oh.
Father God, I do pray that we surrender all of our efforts to you. And Father, I do pray that we give our hearts completely to you. Father, we thank you for the blessing that it has been here today. And Father, I pray as we go about into the world, outside the walls of this church building, that we may be the witness of Christ that we are called to be. Father, again, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Happy Mother's Day and God bless you all.